Your Excellencies, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We are going to wait one more minute. Thank you. Can they hear now? Portuguese booth is speaking into the English channel for the French booth. Can you hear well now? One, two, three. Your Excellencies, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Simon. I am honored to be your moderator for this session, which will last the full 90 minutes. We aim to keep it very much on track this morning. It's time to wash up the title of the meeting today. I would like to also recognize that we have a delegation of students and faculties from historically black colleges and universities joining us today. So a very warm welcome to you. And with that, I'd like to ask Shoma Ghosh Malik, the practice manager for Africa Water, to kick off this meeting. Thank you. Good morning. Your Excellencies, Ministers of Finance, distinguished delegates, esteemed guests, and colleagues, and Madam Chair. Thank you for accepting our invitation and to participate in this important event on achieving universal access to water, sanitation, and hygiene in Eastern and Southern Africa region. It's time to wash up. While the world is progressing towards achieving SDG 6.1 and 6.2 on safe access to water and sanitation, Africa East is sliding backwards. The access gaps are increasing significantly. The trend is worse in sanitation and even more so in rural areas. Around 274 million people do not have access to clean water. 467 million people lack access to safe sanitation, even basic sanitation while 162 million people continue to defecate in the open even today in the sub-region, while more than half of the schools and healthcare facilities do not have any access to wash, the cost of inaction is enormous. In today's session, we would like to bring more attention to water and sanitation. In this region, what can we do differently? How can we scale up with speed and in a sustainable manner with bolder approaches, financial priorities, and innovative partnerships to reach our goals of universal access to WASH in Africa regions, particularly in the Eastern and Southern Africa region by 2030. Without further ado, I would like to invite our regional vice president, Victoria Kauka, for opening up the session and addressing the keynote to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shoma. 
uh, honorable ministers, um, government officials, uh, distinguished participants, everybody, good morning. Uh, let me join Shoma in thanking you all very much uh, for being here today for our wash up, time to wash up. Uh, I'm, uh, your presence here shows the importance that you attach uh, to this particular issue. So really appreciate that and look forward to, to a very meaningful conversation this morning. When I started in this job uh, last July, uh, knowing the importance of water and sanitation, I was really surprised in my early briefings to be told what Shoma has alluded to in her remarks, that it's only in Africa that the access gap on water and sanitation is not closing. It is actually widening, and, and that's worrisome. So to, to mention her numbers again, there are 37 million more, more additional uh, than 20 years ago, people without access to clean water, and 247 million more people in Africa without sanitation today. Now, this is, this is really alarming, uh, given all the, the importance that we, we attach to water and sanitation. We know that this takes a huge toll on human and socioeconomic development, and even more for women and girls. So in Eastern and Southern Africa, here at the World Bank, we're putting together a key analytic piece to also show the impacts of these water and sanitation access gaps at the aggregated level on the GDP of countries in the region and to show the transformative role of water investments and reforms to socioeconomic development. Needless to say, we're still far from the level of investments needed to close these gaps. Many countries are still investing far below 1% of their GDP annually. When the World Bank has estimated that to achieve SDG target 6.1, that's access for all to safe drinking water, and 6.2, adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all, and, and open defecation, sub-Saharan Africa countries will need to spend between 1.3 to 2.1% of GDP every year. But also, financial resources are being very inefficiently used. Water providers only collect 20%, only collect 70% of the bills on average. They lose about 40% of the water they produce. Subsidies to the sector are very regressive. By subsidizing inefficient utilities, operations, and maintenance, 60% of the subsidies go to the 20% richest in the populations, meaning that the poor do not benefit from most of the support that is designed to help them. So how do we close access gaps? Water experts conclude that it's time for countries to take a different approach based on systems change in practice, this means adopting five strategic steps. Step one, that countries need a strong water governance and a strong enabling environment. Only about half of the countries in Africa have some legal backing for regulating water services, and less than a third of countries have strong legal backing for sanitation services. Step two, Countries need to leverage more resources. Either alone, even if increased significantly, is still a drop in the bucket or drop in the ocean. What can governments do? Governments can leverage more public funds through transfers, tariffs, and taxes, and consider performance-based criteria when transferring funds to the water sector. They can also leverage funding from other development partners, but also from the private sector and more innovative sources. For example, climate financing. Step three, countries need to fix their service providers both in urban and rural settings. Urban utilities need to become credit worthy. There's still so, too much money inefficiently spent today 
from central ministries and treasuries to subsidize operation and maintenance of water utilities when this money could be used in a more efficient manner to extend services in challenging rural and peri-urban areas. Instead, uh, instead, rural service providers need clear management models and financing systems that differentiate operations from capital expenditures. Step four, we think countries need to address resilience and storage in a more systematic way. Fast-growing cities have deferred these types of investments for too long and now face huge water deficits. But storage also means nature-based solutions, avoiding land degradation in our watersheds and enhancing groundwater management. Proper city sanitation also ensures that those precious resources are not polluted. And step five, we need to join forces and work better together through country and regional platforms for collaboration. This means working in a more coordinated manner with other development partners through country financing platforms led by sector ministries um, to more effectively support national investment programs that aim to accelerate access to water and sanitation. These ideas were presented in New York a couple of weeks ago at the UN Water Conference, where all Africa, uh, Eastern and Southern water ministers and many development partners were present. And we got a quorum. There was indeed consensus amongst all ministers and partners present that we cannot keep doing retail-based, uncoordinated work. And we need to boost our efforts to redress the situation by working in a different manner. We're also not reinventing the wheel. Many of the key ingredients for systems change already exist in some form or other in uh, the countries. It is just that they need to be implemented faster and in a more systematic manner. If countries with enhanced support from development partners and the private sector are able to work together on implementing these agreed principles, Investments in the water sector will be also much more efficient and reach more people for every dollar spent. So it's not only about spending more, but about spending better. We've made a pledge to work towards a significant increase in IDA commitments for water access and sanitation, specifically about $7 billion in IDA support over the next four years for operations that support systems change in nine countries where the access gap are the largest. And additional commitments will follow in other countries as well. But we know well that we cannot do this alone. Water needs to be high on the agenda of the countries. This approach of systems change will be more effective in accelerating access in those countries that prioritize water and sanitation, have a robust national investment program with clear targets, budgets, and adequate systems to implement the necessary actions to increase water and sanitation access. Evidence shows that in these contexts, when the right ingredients are in place, countries can close the gap. In Tanzania, we expect that nine and 10 million rural dwellers will gain access to water and sanitation respectively, thanks to the Rural Water Supply and Sanitation Agency and a performance-based financing mechanism. Those numbers can increase if more public development partner and other private funds are leveraged. Imagine what we can achieve if we replicate experiences like this elsewhere. Ethiopia has made significant gains in recent years in increasing access to water and sanitation services through the One Wash Consolidated Wash Account Program. This platform brings together the ministries of water, health, education, and finance, along with key development partners to channel funds through a consolidated account with the aim of achieving universal access. One plan, one budget, and one report for the wash sector. The One Wash program will provide water and sanitation access to over 10 million people by 2025. The One Wash platform offers great potential to leverage additional development partner funding 
and private finance with significantly reduced transaction costs. So what's our ask from and our commitment to you as ministers? We stand by you and by our development partners to confirm our commitment to help close the access gap in Southern and Eastern Africa by 2030. Our teams are ready, the dialogue has started. After this event, our teams will keep working on implementing systems change for accelerating water and sanitation access. They will meet again in October at a, somewhere at a meeting convened by the World Bank uh, somewhere in the region to confirm joint investment programs and system change through country platforms. These platforms may be led by sector ministers, but will need the significant involvement of all of you as ministers of finance, as financing will be critical to reverse the dire situation and create incentives for systems change so that commitments turn into actions and water and sanitation results for millions of people on the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And just to illustrate the discussions, the very successful discussions that were held in New York, we're going to show you a, a short three minute recap video of the round table discussions in New York. So please would you show the video. Oops. Many countries in Eastern and Southern Africa are not on track to achieve universal access to WASH by 2030 and business as usual will not get them there. The water supply and sanitation access gap even widened in the past two decades. Compared to the year 2000, an additional 37 million people lack access to basic water services and 247 million people to basic sanitation services. At the same time, countries experience rapid population growth, urbanization, and climate change impacts. These megatrends complicate closing the access gap and have severe impacts on water security, public health, economic growth, and regional security. Women and children are amongst the most affected. Many water utilities continue losing money and the bulk of subsidies and resources are going to the wealthiest quintile. But it is not all about pipes. Political will and leadership, accountability and citizen engagement are fundamental to develop the appropriate policies and regulations that enable safe, resilient and sustainable services for all. It is time for systems change that cuts across five strategic dimensions. We must address policy and institutional reform, leverage private, public and partner financing, create incentives for more efficient service providers, build resilience through storage, and prioritize country and regional collaboration platforms. Water access is a human rights agenda and we must not leave anyone behind. E naturalmente que a segurança hídrica tem que ter eh, uma perspectiva. Water security must have a regional perspective. Infrastructural development that is necessary for other infrastructural developments. Because for us, uh, water and sanitation cuts across all sectors. A água pode ser tanto usada para o turismo, para a agricultura, para, para as pescas. It, it is very important for agriculture, the fishing industry, Investing in water form or five dollars for public health. C'est au niveau de leadership et de coordination du gouvernement avec tous les activités de partenaires et de secteur privé. Cédimos iniciar um processo. We are going to initiate a process of reforms, and we are attempting to establish an appropriate framework, an institutional framework, in order to be able to develop activities and produce the necessary reforms. Reach the financing gap, we must change our paradigm and engage private investors. What is your hope is that? Everybody is interested in water and sanitation. Es haber escuchado a eh, las más altas autoridades de muchos de los países asumir 
el compromiso político al más alto nivel y también anunciar una serie de medidas que permitirán concretar eh, el avance. We are really doing a very good job on water and sanitation, but we still have a long way to reach the target of 2030. We need to invest every Muito obrigado. É, eu espero que todos possam ter tido uma ideia do que foi a discussão em Nova York. E agora vamos ter aqui uma discussão com os nossos ilustres ministros. Vossa Excelência tem algumas perguntas para os senhores e senhoras. Depois vamos abrir e conceder a palavra para todos presentes. E vamos ouvir aqui o nosso painel do uh, Banco Mundial. Iniciando com a senhora ministra de Angola. Angola fez grandes avanços diversificando as fontes de financiamento para o setor de saneamento básico e água potável. A senhora poderia nos dizer o que é necessário para poder atrair esse tipo de investimento? Em outros setores, ou de novo, no setor de água. Então, obrigado. Obrigado. Obrigado, Simon, pela pergunta. Obrigado, VP. Victoria for inviting me uh, to be part of that discussion. Um, yes, we are proud about uh, what we managed to achieve with the, the World Bank Group support, uh, specifically on this project uh, that took some time to, to, for us to get it out uh, of the paper, but now it's done, and we managed to, to do the first, the first disbursement a couple, <laughs> a couple of, of days ago, <laughs> so so we are we are proud of it. Um, it's it's a huge project, around one billion dollars, with a warranty of the World Bank, um, a consortial uh, a consortium of banks engaged to address um, the lack of water in Luanda, a huge city uh, with near to 10 million. Uh, uh, citizens living in Luanda, uh, the urban coverage of uh, water is 64% and Luanda is below that uh, and with a lot of people. So it's a huge problem. Uh, so this project will uh, raise this capacity uh, above the 64%. So we, we are proud of this result. And yes, we want to do more, even more, not only at the urban areas, but also uh, at the rural, rural areas uh, to con uh, congregate efforts to uh, address the agricultural needs of irrigation. Uh, it will come uh, all together. But the support uh, that we are getting from the World Bank Group uh, is not only warranty, it's not only money, <laughs> that is good, <laughs> but it's also technical assistance uh, because we uh, want our public companies to be more efficient, uh, to manage all this water with, uh, with less loss, losses. Uh, that's why we are getting uh, a technical assistance to improve the management capacity of those companies, not only at the water side, but also at the, at the electricity side. Um, and we are also working hard in terms of making the tariffs more aligned to the real prices, because we need to give the companies the capacity to maintain those systems, to make sure that in a couple of years, we, need, we do not need to do the same investment uh, because of the lack of maintenance. So it's something that we are also working uh, on that uh, uh, with the World Bank and also looking to the legal environment, uh, the legal framework uh, to make sure that they, they, they are good enough, it's good enough to attract also private investment. We are doing our part, the Treasury is doing uh, its own part, but we want also the private sector to participate. But for that to happen, the legal framework need to be, need to show this openness. So it's something that we are also getting support and uh, hopefully we will see more coming also from, from the private sector in terms of uh, investment on, 
uh, water provision and and also some the the sanitation part uh, one uh, part of the process just to to conclude that we need to put also energy uh, on that is regarding the citizen role on this process uh, how the citizens are using the water the environmental literacy uh, is something that we are doing some initiatives but we need to do more on a consistent way uh, so education should be part of the process and the invest investment on education uh, should be interconnected with the, that investment of it, uh, in infrastructures to make sure that the citizens are, uh, are also an active part of defending that investment and getting good use of the resources that we are putting at their disposal. Thank you. And thank you. Let us move to Tanzania, Your Excellency Minister Shemba. Tanzania has successfully used results-based financing to drive considerable change in the rural water and sanitation sector. Would you mind sharing with us your journey on shifting from a traditional input-based to implementing the results-based financing? And also, would you consider adopting a similar approach for urban WSS services also? Thank you. Your time starts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and thank you, Madam uh, Kwakwa. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, all protocol observed. Uh, for Tanzania, the journey toward uh, the SDG 6 began in 2014 when the government requested around uh, 150 million uh, pounds, uh, approximately uh, 170 million US dollars for, from the Department for International Development of UK, uh, now known as a Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, to implement the performance-based results that the PBR project the program had uh, specific results indicators uh, that not only focused on increased access but also on the access of the implementing agencies to sustain services. By the time uh, of its closing, access to clean water and improving sanitation was successfully increased up to 2.1 million people for water supply and uh, over 208 people for sanitation. The uh, performance-based result had reached all rural districts in the country, including my own district, and is strongly focused on incentivizing its systems uh, change for sustainability for services, resulting in the functionality of water points improving from 30% uh, to 50% up to the uh, uh, close of the project. Moreover, a decision was made to implement a second result-based financing mechanism uh, that was in 2018, uh, in which over 150 million US dollars uh, for the Tanzania Sustainable Rural Water Supply Sanitation Program for results project was implemented, with the financing from the World Bank, uh, uh, popularly known in Tanzania as Bank Dunia, the World Bank, and again. This program included disbursement-linked indicators that not only focused on increased access, but also focused on sustainability of water supply and sanitation authority, that the RUASA, and improved the community-based water supply organization capacity and ensuring accurate and complete monitoring and evaluation on data. By July 2022, it has achieved its target for water supply and sanitation access, providing over 4.67 million uh, beneficiaries with sanitation and 3.37 million beneficiaries with the water supply. It has continues to critically support the technical and financial capacities, strengthening of national and community-based implementing agencies who are primarily responsible for water supply in rural areas. An additional financing of over 300 million US dollars was approved in December 2022, 
expanding the use of result-based financing into the current third phase, and we see this mode of financing important to continue uh, progress as well, we move forward. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you asked the, uh, on the last part of the question, I wish to emphasize that the result-based financing was uh, proved to be effective in water sector programs as it holds out the promise of tackling uh, spending inefficiencies, inefficiencies and making more effective use of available resources. Thank you for allowing me to speak. And thank you also. Moving to Kenya, Honorable Mr. Kiragua, welcome. Kenya has embarked on a long-term transformation of its water and sanitation institutions and policies. Would you mind sharing your experience on the process of adopting the WSS investment framework, including the proposed incentives for reforms and diversity of investment and financing options? How do you think this new framework may facilitate coordination between national government and counties. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Vice President, for hosting us today, uh, today morning. Um, I'd like to s start by the framework. So since the new government got uh, put in place, this uh, happened just last year in August, Kenya has put water as the number one priority in the infrastructure development within the country. Uh, the key aspects that uh, when we looked at this is the government does not have the resources to fund the gap to, uh, to provide 100% access by 2030. We've got a shortfall of approximately $6 billion. Now, how will we fund that $6 billion? We have to be more innovative and get out of the normal BAU. Uh, we've embarked on developing a water purchase agreement to develop uh, water infrastructure through PPPs, through the private sector. Yeah? Uh, we've developed also a list of, of, of pipeline projects that can be actually uh, can achieve financial clues through the private sector. This actually gives us, uh, narrows down the financing gap and also crowds in private sector implementation standards into delivering these projects. We're working very closely with the World Bank, and I thank you again, uh, our, our VP, in terms of uh, when you look at the sector, some of the challenges that we face, uh, one of the big ones when you look at, when we start with the, urban the, the two big urban cities like Nairobi and Mombasa, we waste approximately 50% on non-revenue water. Yeah? There's no way private sector, including government, should put in resources when you're losing 50% into non-revenue water. Uh, we're proud to say some work had been done actually uh, some time back with the World Bank, but we did not progress as we should have. Uh, however, we're embarking on that work and uh, we look to reduce our non-revenue water from the 50% rates that we currently have to approximately sub, to, uh, hopefully to 20%. Yeah? So that's a huge priority for us uh, as a country. Uh, so PPP is one of the key financing options that we're looking at. Uh, we're looking also to scale up uh, public investments in the water sector by creating uh, what, uh, a water fund that will bridge part of the gap in funding uh, uh, water projects. And uh, uh, in terms of absorption, we've got a big challenge on absorbing uh, some of the funds that we get to implement the projects in the water sector. And the challenge comes in, uh, just, there's, a big, there's a big challenge about understanding backability, understanding the, the uh, social safeguards required, social and environmental safeguards required to implement these projects. We might implement these projects, but if you don't follow the processes, you don't get anywhere. And there's a big, uh, there's a big uh, leverage in we are using on DFIs because they have the expertise in-house. And World Bank is one of, the, one of the teams with the biggest capacity. They've done this work before in other markets. So we, there's no need to, re, uh, to start off from scratch. And uh, I thank you, the practice manager. Your team is really supporting us. And to establish, we're looking to work, part, we're partnering with World Bank to establish a safe work framework for the sector so that we're able to replicate projects and also upskill our, our uh, safeguard authority to be able to, for us to do more projects and replicate them. 
Uh, I liked what the minister uh, from Angola talked about sustainability. Yeah, if 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 we don't also look at how the water is used, we don't achieve the goals that we're trying. I mean, we do, uh, the results that we're trying to achieve. Uh, and lastly, on your question uh, on uh, intergovernmental uh, coordination, uh, the Kenya PPP Directorate, which I lead, has actually put together a framework where intergovernmental coordination is centrally run. Yeah. So the bureaucracies which were there in the past have actually been uh, have been taken away, and through the leadership of uh, His Excellency President Ruto, he has made sure that all bureaucracies that were there in the past do not exist. So implementation, and it's, we've got, so in Kenya we've got county governments who are in charge of developing water, uh, water infrastru uh, infrastructure and giving the last mile connectivity. Uh, we've got the national government that does the bulk water supply. But now putting all these people together is, is normally a very complex process. It's not as easy as we've done in the power sector. Yeah? So there's much more work that's required. It's not as easy, trust me. But there's a lot of effort we're putting forward to deliver this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kiragua. Moving to Madagascar, your, your Excellency, would you like to offer your reflections on this discussion so far? Madam Vice uh, President, uh, Mr. Chair, Honorable Minister, and distinguished uh, participant, yes, I would like to give, to share some uh, words about Madagascar. Um, you know, Madagascar has one of the highest renew, re renewable water resources per capita in the world, with an average quantity of uh, 337 million cubic meter a year. And our rivers drain the watershed of more than 57% of the surface of our island. But because of our geographical position, we are also affected by natural disasters and frequently hit by uh, drought in some region. But what we can note regarding our island is that there is a correlation between human Development Index, HDI, and access the access to water and sanitation. The capital of Madagascar, with a relative high HDI, has also a high rate of access to water and sanitation. And the most remote areas uh, are the most exposed to the effect of climate change and have the lowest HDI and the least access to wash. To deal with these uh, inequalities, we have adopted strategic documents called the National Water Quality Policy and have proposed the ratification of the National Policy of WASH to the Parliament, which is a part of the personal commitment of our President of Republic. The objectives are to give access to drinking water at a socially acceptable price for 60% of Malagasy people, to give basic latrines of 55% uh, of Malagasy people, and the possibility for 90% of Malagasy for an open defecation free. However, we can note a successful action between uh, 2019 and 2022 with a significant increase in the rate of access to water, uh, 45 to 52%, and access to sanitation from 18 to uh, 38%, and uh, open defecation free from 14 to 21%. Uh, the effort made by the Malagasy government is also reflected in the annual increase in the budget allocated to the wash sector. Compared to other social sectors, an increase to, of 7 to 11 percent was observed from 2019 uh, to 2022. And compared to external financing, uh, international financing recorded a jump of more than 20% between 2021 and 2022. Um, by uh, 
2030, the cost for the annual financing, financing needs is estimated around $62 million for the availability of water and $1.2 billion for the accessibility of the wash service. And the annual amount currently available is approximately $60 million, and that justifies the call for other financial resources. And to address this gap of financing, we intend to call for public and private partnership to invest in the sector since, as I said earlier, we have one of the highest capacity in the world uh, of uh, renewable uh, water services. We think that adopting the WASH as a business is also uh, one of the ways to improve WASH. And to conclude, let us remember that water supply and success e to uh, basic uh, sanitation and uh, water service uh, are among the essential conditions for sustainable uh, development. Thank you for allowing me to talk. Thank you very much indeed. Moving to Malawi, Your Excellency, would you like to comment on this discussion and would you take two or three minutes to do so if you would like to? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, through you, Chairperson, allow me to thank the Vice President for uh, giving us a chance to participate and also uh, make a small contribution. Uh, first of all, maybe the context for Malawi, um, close to 20% of our disease burden is linked to uh, poor wash. And uh, the absolute number of uh, unsaved people has increased in the last 10 years by uh, 0.9 million for water supply and 1.4 million for um, sanitation. And the official access figures are hovering around 70% for water supply and only 26.6% uh, for sanitation. And uh, this is often marked by poor quality services as well. Uh, let me also put in context that uh, high vulnerability to climate shocks um, has also affected our progress in this aspect, uh, as you do recall. Um, we, in 2019, we had Cyclone uh, Edai, and 2022, we had Cyclone Anna and Cyclone Gombe, and just recently we've been hit uh, by uh, Cyclone Freddy, affecting more of, most of our wash infrastructure uh, as it is. But coming to what government is doing, uh, of course, in partnership with uh, the, the World Bank, uh, currently, I think we are scaling up uh, wash investment. Uh, focused on efficiency improvements and performance-based financing. And uh, with the World Bank support under the Lilongwe Water and Sanitation Project, uh, we've been able to demonstrate ability to enhance utility efficiency, there, uh, thereby reducing our fiscal burden on uh, the water utilities, as well as uh, achieve uh, impact at scale with strong uh, impacts on human capital development and urban resilience. The plan is to scale up similar interventions, starting with Blanta City and then expand to uh, the other regions. Uh, one thing that we've also uh, done recently is consolidating water sector reforms uh, to incentivize service improvement, expansion, and resilience. While there is um, uh, service delivery structure in place for urban water supply and sanitation services, the service organization and sustainability of rural water and sanitation uh, still remains a challenge. And government is currently reviewing a number of uh, sector policies like the, what, the national water policy, the national sanitation policy, and uh, very soon we will be developing our uh, sector investment plan and performance-based financing mechanisms to incentivize improvements in service quality and uh, delivery. And lastly, we're looking at uh, trying to mobilize uh, uh, finance by crowding in the private sector. And I would say um, one thing uh, in our engagement with the private sector that keeps coming up over and over again is uh, the issue to do with um, uh, water being a human right aspect and whether government should be subsidizing or not subsidizing. I think that is the main concern that private sector keeps uh, um, uh, pointing out over and over again. If it's uh, a level on fuel, 
uh, it has worked perfectly in maintenance of roads and uh, the road infrastructure uh, uh, financing. But then the argument that is going on right now is whether we do need to put some level on water uh, targeting the richer end uh, as maybe we subsidize the poor end uh, because most of the private sector is willing to finance um, water investment uh, projects if they can have some sort of guarantee of ring fenced resources that payment will come up from. So all of these are some of the conversations that uh, we're having in Malawi, but we've put investment in WASH as our priority. Thank you. Moving back across the table to the Kingdom of Lesotho, Your Excellency, would you like to add something to this discussion? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, I must, uh, through you, uh, say, pay my respects to Ms. Kwakwa, the Vice President. Uh, indeed, we would like to say something, and uh, one issue that I think is important for us to note is that Lesotho is known to have abundant clean water and uh, a water tower for the southern African region. We have taken advantage of this position uh, particularly to see that our population is provided with uh, clean water and uh, not only that that we are supplying the region as well, in this case South Africa uh, for now, um, and more likely going into Botswana as well with uh, the provision of water. So it is an important uh, foreign exchange or foreign uh, currency ENA for, for us. So uh, we are investing on understanding uh, how we can maximize the, u maximize the use of this uh, important resource. And uh, to that effect, we are not only looking into the use of the water, we are also looking into issues of preservation as well. So we are working on, uh, among others, the preservation of our, um, uh, the, the ecosystem around the water and the uh, catchment management so that we manage the catchment areas for, for the water. So uh, obviously, therefore, water supply plays a critical role in supporting the advancement of our socioeconomic development. Uh, it contributes about 10% to our GDP currently, and uh, this is mostly from exports to South Africa, export of water to South Africa. Um, it also, we have taken advantage of this uh, valuable resource to also generate power. Uh, so at least about 40% uh, of the power, if not 50%, uh, that we are using is coming from uh, the hydro power generation that we, are, we, are, we have invested in. And uh, I must say that uh, for us, it is important to maintain the integrity of our water supply sources and, of course, pla placing climate change resilience at the center of the water management uh, uh, approaches that we use. Uh, at current, at the, the, the current time, uh, more than 400,000 of the 2 million inhabitants of uh, Lesotho uh, need improved uh, drinking water sources, although uh, the country is endowed with these rich water resources. This is a result of uh, lack of finances for investing in uh, uh, water reticulation systems so that <coughs> they are able to, um, to receive water. Um, when we look into other areas about uh, more than 42% for, of the schools, uh, our schools do not yet have clean water supply within the school parameters, I mean, uh, school premises. However, efforts are being made so that uh, all, our, all our schools have uh, clean water systems within them. 
Uh, while access to basic drinking water services is high, at about 80 percent, uh, there is still need to improve the quality of the service uh, that goes to the population. So the water service delivery efficiency to the urban areas needs to be improved. And we also have to cater for the rising need and demand for uh, uh, industrial uh, industrial firms uh, and rap the rapid mm -hmm. urbanization uh, that we see uh, within our country. Regarding sanitation, uh, almost half the population uh, needs improved uh, sanitation systems and uh, they also need to be able to have uh, water uh, connected uh, uh, latrines uh, as it is. So the response from our government uh, comprises both financing mechanisms, looking into financing mechanisms and systems change policy. So in terms of financing, we have the World Bank, the European Investment Bank, the African Development Bank, and other uh, 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 development partners providing support to the government of Lesotho uh, to provide this uh, resource better and to expand bulk water infrastructure uh, within Lesotho, at least to half of the country, the lowlands, uh, where the majority of the population lives. And secondly, in terms of capacity building, uh, there is work that's been done uh, to see that our water institutions or the institutional arrangements around management of water are capacitated. Uh, so we are working uh, to deliver uh, uh, you know, performance, uh, better performance in this regard. And uh, we are doing this through what we call the Soto Lowlands Water Development uh, Project. Uh, it's phase two of that project. Uh, proper sanitation planning is required for investments in the short, uh, medium, and long term for maximum impact. Uh, and the Lesotho Highlands, I mean, the Lesotho Lowlands Water Development Project is supporting the government in sanitation planning. And finally, I would like to say that uh, the water resources that we need, uh, that we, we have, need to be uh, properly accounted for need to be taken care of so that we look into issues of sustainability of these very important uh, resources. Uh, that's why uh, we are in the process of establishing what we call the Bulk Water Authority, whose uh, mandate will be mainly to look into uh, uh, sustainability and management of the, the, the resources to see that we, we maintain the integrity, the cleanliness, and the, uh, the volumes of the water uh, at, at a constant level. So we, are, we will be happy to join this initiative proposed by the World Bank to redress a lack of faster uh, progress to achieve universal access to wash. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Switching to South Sudan, Your Excellency, would you like to come in on this conversation? And if so, please keep your remarks to just two minutes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and I would like also to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, the Vice President Kokwa for also inviting us to be part of these uh, meetings. Um, the issue uh, based on the topic being discussed today, uh, South Sudan uh, seem to be very unique uh, because it is a new country and also the history of flooding that is happening uh, in South Sudan uh, caused by climate change is also very unique in the sense that uh, this country experienced constant floodings. I think for uh, about three years constantly, and a huge part of the country uh, remain underwater, 
in most cases. Uh, it is the same country which is uh, almost 80% uh, herbals suitable for agriculture. But still, if you look at the story, uh, the population, the rural population, uh, suffered from lack of uh, food and also suffered from uh, uh, floodings and at the same time uh, later experienced uh, lack of water. Uh, you can imagine uh, the area being flooded uh, and later on this water will uh, disappear until uh, the people, the, the rural population will not be able to access water. So <laughs> we are looking into this scenario uh, to see what can be done to address this issue uh, because it is not uh, merely lack of water and water can be there and even uh, flooded even uh, the, 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 the place where the population live and later on the same people will not have uh, water and people, uh, rural men and rural women walk uh, many miles to page water. Uh, this is a, a challenge uh, the country is facing. Uh, in this case, I think uh, it's not only an issue of getting uh, uh, money to, to, to finance uh, this uh, project, but also it requires uh, an intervention of uh, experts who can actually tell uh, or help the rural population what needs to be done uh, in this case. Uh, for us, we are looking at a way because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are a new country and we have not yet uh, uh, developed uh, a strong policies to address this issue. And uh, it means, uh, together with the help of, uh, of uh, World Bank uh, and, and, and a team from World Bank have been in the country, uh, we had a meeting with them and uh, it was all around the issues of uh, addressing floodings and, 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 and the water challenges. Uh, some work has been done so far, but we are still uh, thinking that uh, uh, we really need to do something to, to make sure uh, this flooding is tend uh, to be a, a sufficient way of also providing water to the, to the population. Because if, this, uh, if we can create uh, storage facilities, uh, this water that comes and, and, and goes away will be stored and uh, it can be used for irrigation and also the, the rural population will be able to access this water also for drinking. Uh, so um, our case, as I said, is very unique. If you go to this country during flooding, you will see uh, the whole bus area will look very green. You will think it is a rice plantation, but that is just a, a grass. So uh, this is why I was saying it requires expert support so that uh, this uh, bus land that uh, grows with uh, green uh, grass can be turned into rice, and, uh, and, and other things that can be grown in, in, in water. So uh, I think this is uh, what I can say about uh, the issue of flooding in South Sudan. Thank you. We have time for a couple more countries before we turn to the panel. Your Excellency from Burundi, would you like to come in on this discussion? Thank you, Mr. Simon. Thank you, VP, for this meeting. Uh, I'm going to make a general comment, but I'm going to do it in French. We need to put your head on to, to listen to me. Je vais faire un, un commentaire général sur... Uh, I'd like to make a general comment on this uh, very topical issue. The question of access to water and sanitation is a real concern for us. And in fact, uh, investing in water and sanitation 
uh, for us is an obligation uh, that falls on the government. It is part of the public services that we must provide to our population. And it is very useful to have this discussion on the ways and means by which we can improve access to water and sanitation. I will not cite all the figures for Burundi. In our country, we have about 60% of the population that has access to water within 30 minutes. Um, very often, the, the access is not immediately in the household, but one has to travel a certain distance depending on the infrastructure in place. So people have access to common water taps, whereas, and this is mainly in the rural areas, whereas in urban areas we have water at home. But on average you can say 60% of the population has access to water within less than 30 minutes. Nevertheless, these 30 minutes are often um, 30 minutes that affect women and young people, though they are the ones who have to go out to collect water. And so this has an effect on their time, uh, time for school for children. And sometimes young girls, instead of going to school, have to stay home and go out to fetch water for the family. So this is a major concern for us which we would like to deal with in order to find a solution. Now, what are some of the challenges that we face to develop uh, access to water and sanitation? Well, generally, uh, the first challenge is the lack of financial resources because it is expensive to uh, set up a clean water supply, whether it's in a village or in towns and cities. Another challenge that we are faced with in developing the appropriate infrastructure to facilitate such access is uh, the rapid development of our urban centers and even the villages. Uh, this is a reality in many African cities. These cities expand without any appropriate planning and so access to water and sanitation is not available as part of a plan. So you will find a city developing very quickly without the uh, adequate uh, access to water and sanitation. And so you can have, even in urban centers, people who have no access to clean water and sanitation. Another challenge is uh, the fact that uh, Housing is often widespread. Um, many houses may be remote from each other. So even if you want to develop the infrastructure, it's very difficult to have access to the whole population. So this is another uh, challenge that we need to work on and see how we can organize uh, things and plan um, uh, housing uh, appropriately. In Burundi, we've started to work on all of this. We have uh, attempted to set up a unified uh, planning strategy with the Ministry of Water and Sanitation, Housing, Town and Country Planning. All of these ministries have to work together to come up with a unified strategy which would enable the population then to have better access to water and sanitation. In urban centers as well, we have decided to clearly um, delimit uh, the urban centers and make sure that we do away with unplanned housing developments um, which make it more difficult to provide access to water and sanitation. We think that we need to involve the private sector because the government can do, can't do everything by itself. But if we want to at attract the private sector, then we must ensure that uh, these private investors get a return on their investments. So very briefly, this is what I can say about the issue. But definitely, for our government, 
We know that the budget allocation is still very low, about 0.4% of GDP. But uh, we are faced with many other demands uh, which uh, keep this figure very low. But it is certainly a concern for our government. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, we would like to invite the uh, Honourable Minister from Mauritius to say a couple of words. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Dear Mrs. Kwakwa, dear colleague ministers and distinguished participants, it's a pleasure, a real pleasure for us to be here today and to participate in the discussion. I take this opportunity to warmly thank the World Bank, in particular Mrs. Kwakwa, for its invitation. I wish first share the progress made by Mauritius to ensure a fairer and greater access to water, sanitation and hygiene. And also, I would then discuss the challenges we face to fully achieve the six SDG, particularly in view of the effects of climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, Mauritius is a small island developing state which has its independence since 55 years uh, uh, and it was in 1968. We have made huge progress in terms of water access. Today, thanks to the vision of the Prime Minister and the large investment made in water infrastructure, all motions have access to safe and affordable drinking water, as well as improved uh, sanitation. The World Bank has been and is an historic development partner for Mauritius along with other DFIs and supportive countries, which have played an important role in this process. We are actually currently working on forthcoming pro water projects, both in Mauritius and Rodrigues Islands, for the benefit of the Mauritian people and also the Rodrigans, especially the most vulnerable ones. Ladies and gentlemen, Related to the achievement of the SDGs, Mauritius has deployed tremendous efforts to eradicate poverty, mainly absolute poverty. According to the latest UNECA paper published in, on the 23rd December 2022, I quote, the lowest level of poverty in Africa is in Mauritius. We are really proud of this achievement. However, that being said, it is an, an ongoing process, and a lot still needs to be done to keep up with our rapid changing environment. Indeed, growing economic activities, far, fast urbanization, and changing land use practice, practices have significantly increased water demand. In addition, climate change is exacerbating water scarcity and water-related hazards. As a small island country exposed to meteorological disasters, Mauritius is increasingly subject to an irregular rainfall pattern causing flash floods and droughts. Although we receive around 4 billion meter cube of rainfall annually, we still experience seasonal water scarcity and only a fraction of the rainfall can be utilized. There is a need for a more modern water distribution network to prevent considerable water losses. Actually, it is estimated that non-revenue water is as high as 60%. Ladies and gentlemen, protecting our natural resources and ensuring fair access to potable water is a national priority. Thus, over the last budget, we have announced a number of measures to address the water issues representing around 4% of our GDP. These include the implementation of a massive pipe replacement program to minimize leakages and reduce losses, installation of containerized pressure filtration plants to improve water supply in dry spots, as well as large investments to build new reservoirs new treatment plants and upgrade the existing ones. As regards sanitation, 
we are implementing a major program for developing a sewer network over the island and increasing wastewater treatment. Ladies and gentlemen, these measures require substantial financial resources. While Mauritius GDP has grown by 8.7% in 2022, there's a need as well as opportunities for more private sector's participation in such projects. International cooperation should and would will play a bigger role uh, as more concessional financing from donor countries and institutions could easily be used to leverage more private financing. It is the only way altogether that we can achieve the six SDG. Thank you, Chair. Excellency Shide, good morning, welcome for Ethiopia. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'd like to give you the last word to you before we go to the World Bank Group Senior Management Panel for their reflections. Thank you. Access to WASH is the foundation for other development plans, and the government of Ethiopia is committed to providing safe, affordable WASH services to all Ethiopian citizens. Ethiopia has made great strides in the last decade the only sub-Saharan country to meet the MDG target for water supply. The government of Ethiopia has a long history of working with the World Bank. Currently, we have three large water projects. The One Wash Program, which has consolidated financing of US dollar 690 million. US dollar 300 million is IDA financing. The second urban water supply and sanitation project, which has USD 445 million in IDA financing and the Horn of Africa groundwater for resilience project, which has a financing envelope of US dollar 210 million for Ethiopia. I want to focus on Ethiopia's One Wash national program. One Wash is a flagship initiative that has integrated imp implementation between sectors, water, health, education, and finance. And the development partners under the banner One Plan, One Budget, One Program to streamline and harmonize implementation of wash, wash interventions. With the One Wash national program, we have seen integration, alignment, and the coordination in practice where the four sectors, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Water, Ministry of Education, and Ministry of Health, and development partners are working hand in hand. Now, in its second phase of implementation, we have consolidated efforts and resources of the government of Ethiopia with seven major sector partners and the first steed support of the World Bank. Still, nearly 57 million people lack access to basic water supply. 100 million lack access to safe basic sanitation, safe and basic sanitation, and at least 20 million practice open defecation. Climate change is exacerbating challenges of wash service delivery and sustainability. There is growing demand for improved access and quality services. The cost of meeting national wash universal access target by 2030 is US dollar 10 billion. Assuming business as usual, funding from the government of Ethiopia budget and from development partners, we have an estimated financing gap of over USD 5 billion. As we come closer to the end of the second phase of the One Wash National Program, we need to take a critical look at what needs to be done differently. Accelerate implementation and revisit the way we work. We cannot do business as usual. What has worked well? What needs to be done better and differently? How do we address impact of climate change in a more comprehensive manner so we can break the cycle of reactive emergency support? We must be result-oriented and deliver as per the targets and the commitments set under the One Wash National Program. The level of coordination and integration among sectors should be further improved at the federal, regional, and uh, WORADA or district levels. Infrastructure alone will not fully address the challenge of access and sustainability of wash services. A lot is needed in integrated hygiene promotion, capacity building, and institutional building. We should focus and aim for sustainable service delivery. Due to the conflict, drought, and COVID-19 and other emergencies, the attention and support from the regional government to wash activities was constrained. Minister of Finance closely follows up and supports the sector through regular portfolio reviews. We will continue to ensure expedite implementation progress at the regional and local levels. There is a need to promote and, and motivate result-based implementation to address aspects of cost recovery, tariff, targeting of subsidies to promote sanitation resource gap and the mobilization strategy. And we need to consolidation of instrument in the future engagement with P4Rs and DPOs. There are constraints 
financing gaps, capacity for implementation, too much or too little water for source sustainability, and limited private sector participation. We need to address this constraint with innovative and effective solutions. For example, by developing strategies to enhance storage, build cred creditworthy utilities and service providers, establish accountability in service provision, and enable responsive private sector engagement. This can be done by working together. We are already making progress. One Wash is an example of a coordinated, collaborative country financing platform. We are committed to scaling this up to the up to to meet our goal of universal access to Wash. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move, and I can see the World Bank Senior Management Panel is itching to respond to all these energetic <laughs> interventions. So, starting with Madam Kwakwa, would what are your You'd like them to go first. I see that's a good deflection. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Junaid, well, who has the hot potato? <laughs> I think, Savesh, the, uh, the floor is yours. Take three or four minutes, tell us your thinking. And uh, in particular, I would like to hear what are your, your thoughts on, on really action-oriented progress moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellencies, Ministers of Finance, government officials, good morning. Uh, each one of you have commented on the scale and the urgency of the challenge, of the water and sanitation challenge in the region. Uh, multiple statistics about access have been mentioned this morning. There's one statistic that particularly resonated with me, having a young child of my own, is that waterborne illnesses is the leading cost of child death in, in the region. It, more than 8% of child deaths happen because of this reason. So clearly, all of you have prioritized achievement of SDG 6, universal access of water and sanitation by 2030. And you've all touched upon the need for Im involving private sector in this endeavor from two so for, for two reasons. One, is the amount of investments that needed. According to the World Bank Group, every year we need to invest more than $20 billion in creating the infrastructure for providing the safe water and sanitation services, that's one. And then all of you have mentioned the need for efficiency, to bringing in private sector investors to invest efficiently in the capital expenditure, to maintain efficiently the services, as well as to look at reducing uh, uh, water, water wastage. So to, to bring private sector investors in, what is the role IFC can help to play as part of the World Bank Group in this endeavor? I'd like to make three points. The first point is that as a leading DFI focusing on private sector, IFC has the tools, a wide variety of tools across the value chain to help create, to support, and to advise private sector-oriented projects in this space. Number two, over the last few years, we put in a whole lot of intellectual capacity from IFC's global resources on the continent in Africa to work with each one of you in your countries to help create projects in the private sector. And number three, uh, as Simon touched upon, there are already some scalable, innovative programs that IFC has launched in this space, and I'll touch upon all the three points. So in terms of the tools IFC has at its disposal, uh, you're probably aware that a few years back we set up an upstream team to focus on creating projects focusing on private sector and infrastructure development. We have now more than 40 uh, professionals all over Sub-Saharan Africa that focus on this team. This team works with early stage companies, companies which are still at a seed stage or just thinking through the investments, uh, uh, invest, uh, investments that they want to undertake to make early stage venture capital equity investments or provide debt funding to them. This team can also work with the governments as we are doing in multiple countries uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa to think through what is required for private sector investors to come in to open a particular sector. They can also provide consulting services to private sector companies 
if they want to look at new area or uh, new areas of uh, investments from private sector perspective. The second tool that we've been using quite successfully in Sub-Saharan Africa is our public-private partnership advisory. So this is a team independent from my investments team. There's a Chinese wall arrangement between IFC to separate the team from the investments, mainstream investment side. But the team works with your U PPP units to structure projects to, to, to structure projects with the right risk return framework and then help the implementing agencies to bid these projects for attracting private sector investors in. And then traditionally, <clears throat> the third tool that IFC has is all our resources, blended finance resources, as well as equity and debt investment resources that we can bring to bear to add patient capital as the companies, private sector companies in this space plan to grow. Point number two, over the last few years, we have added significant resources in sub-Saharan Africa on the ground to help create and to sustain private sector projects in, in the water and sanitation area. So within my team, we have more than 120 people all over sub-Saharan Africa focusing on this sector. And over the last few years, we've taken some of our global sector experts in the water sector and, uh, and put them in places like uh, uh, Luanda as well as elsewhere in the continent to help create more capacity for the IFC team in the region to deliver projects. And then third, we are working on projects or programs which are scalable and replicable. I'll take the example of one such project uh, which is called Scaling Rewater Initiative. Some of you are probably aware of the Scaling Solar, success of Scaling Solar Initiative and in creating, supporting multiple scaling solar projects uh, uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa. Building on the experience there, our team has now developed tools and, uh, and, uh, and framework agreements that can be very quickly deployed in a, in a given country context to provide advice, advice to the country governments and to implementing agencies to create and to bring in private sector investors into the PPP structures in the continent. So I'm happy to inform you that already in some cases in, in our region, uh, we are undertaking such projects. I'll take a couple of examples. We are working with the government of Botswana uh, to help uh, to structure a PPP advisory project in the, in the water sector. And then very recently, we signed a mandate with the municipality of Durban in South Africa to also put a project together through this. So again, uh, continue to reassure all of you with the strong commitment of the World Bank Group and of IFC to help support you in your endeavors in attracting private sector investors into this space. Thank you. Thank you very much for your strong commitment, uh, Suresh. Moving to MIGA. With Junaid, please, Junaid, the floor is yours. Uh, Honorable Ministers, uh, I, I have to tell you I'm, I'm caught between two, uh, two thoughts. One was to go back to my old job. I was the first uh, senior director of water for the World Bank in which we brought all the water sectors together. So I'm just as itching to talk about water writ large. But now I'm vice president for MIGA about private sector. So maybe I'll just restrain myself <laughs> and talk uh, from the perspective of MIGA. Um, but the two, will, the two will come together. Let me, if uh, the Honorable Minister of Ethiopia will allow me to use the example of Ethiopia, but not in the water sector, but in the telecom sector. In the telecom sector, Ethiopia has just launched a private telecom operator, and MIGA has guaranteed one billion dollar into that uh, uh, company. Of that one billion dollar, how much did we put in as a guarantee? We put in hundred million dollars. Uh, PSW Ida put in seventy-five million dollars first loss. So the structure of first loss and our hundred million brought in a billion dollars of equity into Ethiopia in the telecom sector. 
I unfortunately can't give you such examples in the water sector. And why is it that we can't give you these examples? It goes back to what the minister from Malawi mentioned. How do you price water? You know, we are, we are all told it's about time we priced carbon. We still have not learned how to price water. And yet we're trying to price carbon. Um, I remember a long time ago from my work that for poor people, the most expensive water is free water. When we promise free water to poor people, it usually gets captured by the middle class and above. I remember going to Lilongwe with uh, uh, Mr. Wolfenson when he was president of the world. I was his assistant. And we went into one of the informal communities in uh, Lilongwe with the Minister of Finance. And a very senior lady came out waving a paper. And the paper, I could see, was a water bill. And I said, oh no, in front of all the NGOs, we're now going to get accused of pricing water. And what this lady did was tell Wolfenson, you see this? I pay for water. And you know what? I'm very proud of it. Because for the first time, the state has recognized me as a citizen. They have given me a water bill. I would have never thought of that as, an, as a response of, of a poor person. Similarly, in India, I remember we were trying to link water utilities into the informal sector. And one of the communities in, Andhra, in uh, uh, Hyderabad said, we don't want to be linked to the water utility. And we said, why? They said, we have much more faith in the informal water provider whom we pay for than in the water utility that's going to give us free water, but there'll be no water in the pipes. Right? Fundamentally, if we can somehow ring fence a flow of resources, public sector resources, MEGA with the World Bank and IFC can leverage that into a billion dollar if necessary. But it requires from your side the willingness and the ability to design institutions of service delivery in which there is 35% flow of money no more. The rest should be your public sector, and then we would de-risk your public sector flow of money, and that would allow you to bring in private sector. The one lesson that I've learned, it's not the willingness to pay that's the problem, it's the willingness to charge. Right? And it's not 100% charge that you want to do. You want to do 35% charge, and the rest from your public budget, but you present the public budget in a way that we can de-risk and make it credible into the market, we'll bring in the private money. Municipalities should be running on private money and water. My last point that I'd like to make is, uh, and here I'll be, uh, I'll be the Bangladeshi that I am and not the VP. The G7 wants you to go into an energy transition. I think the voice of the developing world should be it's time for a water transition. Right. The water transition and what I've heard from all of you, which I did not hear 10, 12 years ago from ministers, was you look at water in a holistic way, in an ecosystem. You're talking about institutions. You're talking about sustainability. You're talking about service delivery. That is such a powerful statement from all of you. Please continue that statement because it's really the ministers of finance and the ministers of local government that are the key people in delivering water across the world. Uh, and we are committed to working with both, both from our public side as well as from our private side. Uh, and the final point, I guess, is uh, to repeat a, a point that all of you have mentioned. Ultimately, even if it's a billion dollar we can deliver, it's the capacity that we bring with it to support you in your endeavor. That's probably what the World Bank Group offers the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Junaid. Victoria. Uh, thank you very yours. much. Um, l let me first recognize the, the permanent secretary uh, from Botswana. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you. Um, look, I, I think as, uh, <laughs> Savesh and uh, Junaid 
have summed up nicely and, and said some very uh, thoughtful, bro uh, provoking uh, things. But, but let me add a little bit and, and just uh, say some of what I've heard and, and what it means for us going forward. Um, you know, oh, a couple of reflections. You know, clearly a lot is happening. And clearly this issue is getting onto the radar screens of, of ministers of finance and governments. And that's good. Um, and also, I hear that it is possible. We, we heard the minister from Mauritius talk about Mauritius has made it, you know, and it is possible for others to do. We heard about the big investment in Bitter uh, that has been achieved in Angola, which hopefully will make a huge difference in Luanda. So it is possible to also do the big things, to, to reach the goals, to achieve the big, to do big things, to contribute to the goals. And so uh, this is really happening. And what I heard the minister saying was, but it took too long, you know, so we, we need to f find ways. I'm sure this took maybe 10 years to do, I don't know, but maybe not as long, <laughs> seven, too long. So we, we have to learn and be able to do the big things and do them not in seven years. Why seven years? So that's also something we need to think about. But it is possible, a lot is happening, and we have to see how we accelerate, build on what is already happening to really get more and more countries uh, to the, the, the last point. Um, you know, I've also heard everybody talking about climate and sustainability. You know, this shows the reality of what we're working with. We're recognizing the nexus uh, between water and climate and, and also the need to do things in a sustainable way is, is really important. And you've all spoken about institutions and policy. You're saying institutions and policy matter. It's not just about investments. So whether it's a legal framework that I think the minister from Angola mentioned, whether it's uh, pricing, uh, that our colleague Junaid has uh, responded to very eloquently, the sectoral policies, um, all of that is there. So we're recognizing that as the governments do these uh, things, as you s try to reach your goals, it's not just about we do investments. If the policies aren't right, if the sector environment is, is distorted, um, it's not going to get you there. So, so that has to be a big plank of what we continue to do going forward. And linked to the policies and so on and institutions is well-functioning utilities that we all said. And we see it, whether it's in energy or water, that utilities must function. And it's really important also for the private sector and getting the private sector in, which all of you have mentioned as important. So we're not seeing this just as the public sector needs to solve the problem. It has to be with the private sector. And uh, we've seen these successful examples of leveraging private sector. But we, we need to be do more. That, that has to be uh, where we're trying to do more. And then the coordination across government so here, ministers of finance talking about water, the, you know, and, um, and then coordination across different levels of government uh, with their different and respective roles and all of that coming together in a synergistic way uh, to help achieve. That's also very important. And how do you uh, make that happen? And then the regional trade, which we, we've heard from Lesotho, and Lesotho having abundance of water resources and, and being able to use that to help other countries in the sub-region. I think that's also very powerful and, and something that we, we need to work at uh, some more. I was really uh, in, uh, excited, struck by uh, Minister Vera, your point about uh, the role of citizens and citizens, and you've touched on it as well. You know, whether it's in their role as m helping manage the resources uh, from different angles, whether it's environmental and so on, be being beneficiaries, but also being stewards of the resource. It speaks to the issue of sustainability, or whether it's their willingness to pay, which we hear is there. You know, all of that is, is also something we need to work on and leverage more uh, for this very important uh, objective. Um, and then we've seen platforms working very well. Uh, the minister from Ethiopia has talked about that and the platforms that bring all the developing partners together uh, around a broad strategy to achieve. Uh, so, 
you know, I, I go away, I come away from this discussion really encouraged that, yes, we, we, we are not where we want to be, but we can't turn the tide and we can't turn things around, not just to move in the right direction, but actually to reach the goal. You know, uh, and I want to, just a small point uh, about the service providers. You know, when I worked in Vietnam, a lot of communities were not serviced by the big utilities. Right. They were serviced by small operators that the government or the, the sub-national governments allowed to function, who served maybe 2,000 clients or services, and that worked very well. And they knew them, and they were very easily available to come and fix something if something got broken and so on. And, and so there are different models to look at that can all come together to be part of the solution uh, here. Uh, so as I said, I come away encouraged. Uh, I, I like the fact that there's a lot of attention that uh, governments are giving to this. Uh, we need to keep the momentum build on what is happening well, uh, correct uh, what needs to be corrected, and, and continue to bring creativity and ideas to it. My, what I also realize, and, and I, you know, I'm being very honest, is that for us at the bank, we, we don't work enough with um, uh, IFC and MEGA. You know, mm -hmm. The One World Bank Group needs to come together better. And, and so that's a commitment that we're making, that we will join up more. Um, and, and try to, to come to you with the support that you need in a more holistic way uh, so that, you know, come 2030, we can all celebrate and, and say, uh, yes, we, we made it, if, if not for every country, for the majority of countries. And that will be a real change in the story from what it is now. But thank you all very Excellent. much for being here this morning. Thank you. And thank you, Victoria, very much. We started this discussion with the Water GP with Shoma, so we're going to end it now with the Water GP with Catherine Toby, who's also a practice manager from Eastern and Southern Africa. And forgive the pun, but would you boil this down, please, into the key actions and thoughts as we move forward? Thank you. Okay, in 60 seconds or less. <laughs> No, seriously, um, Your Excellencies, Lady Gentlemen, Madam Chair, truly inspiring listening to, to you all. And I think this call for business as usual is simply not sustainable, I think is, is, is loud and clear. And I think, you know, highlighting particularly the special role that, that fi ministries of finance have in looking at this sector through this really important lens and setting the right incentives, thinking about WASH as a, as a business but also thinking about citizen engagement, accountability, and how do we deal with these layers of shocks that have become persistent, right? Whether it's the floods, whether it's fiscal. And so on next steps, how do we keep this momentum in, in the words of, 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 of Victoria? I, I would suggest two things. One is really taking this down at the country level and really thinking about platforms, how to, how to leverage this financing, how to work collectively as a World Bank group, but with also our development partners and at the national level, but also with these lo local governments, right, which are so important. So how do we work together and, and, and let's use this momentum to sit and, 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 and have those collective discussions together in country, but then also regionally, how do we build on today and on New York a couple of weeks ago to maintain that momentum, to, to keep sharing less lessons, inspiring each other, and, and very much a call as, as at the start of the meeting to think about who would like to host an event that we co-organize maybe in the fall in Africa this time to really, again, sort of take stock of progress and, and, and keep learning each other and keep working together on this water transition, which I think is beautifully captured. So um, to be continued. Thank you all. We can, we can offer to host in a December. Yes. <laughs> we, we, thank you. It's a deal. So it if you deal. would just s remain seated and, and do not panic, we are going to have a group photograph quickly because I know everybody wants to get a picture of who's who in the room. So where is our photographer? Is it you, Nisha? Okay, why don't you do one from each end, then you get capture. Or we have a lady here with a... Yes, with a 
better camera than mine. With a better camera. Could you perhaps do one from each end? So thank you all. And while we're getting ready for that and you prepare your smiles, I'd just like to thank you for allowing me to host this event with you. My name is Simon. It's a pleasure. I'm an independent consultant, and I hope I see you again sometime. Thank you. Can you do the whole room? <laughs>